Hey, Astrid. Hey, what? You're the top. Thank you. What? You're the top. You're a German flyer. You're the top. You're machine gun fire. You're a U-boat chap with a lot of pep. You're grand. You're the German blitz, the Paris Ritz, an army van. What on earth are you doing? I am singing one of the hits of Charlie and his orchestra, of course. Ah, yes. The Nazi jazz band created by Josef Goebbels to demoralize the Allies. Exactly. I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Astrid Dynot. And this is a World War II special episode on jazz in the service of Nazi Germany. Nazis and jazz fans. And they never have been. The music blossomed in the Weimar era, particularly in Berlin, along its fashionable Kurfürstendamm. This is how jazz age icon Josephine Baker will recall it later in life. The city had a jewel-like sparkle, especially at night. That didn't exist in Paris. The vast cafes reminded me of ocean liners powered by the rhythms of their orchestras. There was music everywhere. But the Nazis considered this blossoming to be that of an alien import, one which undermines German culture. Not only is jazz a product of America, but it originated in black communities and is promoted by Jewish Americans. The syncopated rhythm of the music is unsuitable for marching and instead encourages promiscuity among normally good Germans. So jazz is basically as un-Nazi as you can get. <laughs> Reichsminister of Propaganda Josef Goebbels has led the charge against it. He created the Reichskulturkammer, the Reich Chamber of Culture, in September 33, that was, right? Right. So that he might control culture life in Germany. Mm -hmm. All performers have to be registered with the specially made Reichsmusikkammer. If they have unacceptable credentials and fail certain musical tests, they can't work as musicians. Hmm. A range of other ordinances came into effect during the 1930s. Jazz on the radio was banned. The sale of recordings created by non-Aryans was prohibited and an index of undesirable and harmful music was issued. This last one effectively prohibited the performances of music created by black or Jewish people. Certain Gauleiters and regional police chiefs also instituted total bans on jazz music. But there has never been a nationwide prohibition. The laws are messy and enforced chaotically. Plus, musicians still find clever ways to play their favorite pieces, like renaming the classic Tiger Rag Schwarze Panther, so official in the audience won't get suspicious. Schwarze Pantherzeit. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> Don't you laugh. Okay. <laughs> And actually, the story of jazz in Germany is more complicated than one of just prohibition. Because Reichsminister Goebbels realized pretty quickly that people actually quite like jazz. Plus, they can easily listen to it on foreign radio waves where they won't only hear degenerated jazz, but maybe also uncensored news and even anti-Nazi propaganda. The best way to nip this in the butt is to set up a Nazi-approved jazz band. Yeah. Aww. And the first attempt at this was the Golden Seven, which beamed out to the whole nation on Berlin's Deutschland Sender. Established in late 1934, the Golden Seven was made up of top-quality jazz musicians, but playing arrangements tamed by a Nazi band leader. The experiment was pretty short-lived. The band lost their official radio contract in the summer of 1935. Jazz was then completely banned on German airwaves in the autumn anyway. Yes, but this is just the start of the quest to create Neue Deutsche Tanzmusik, or New German Dance Music. Mm. There were many experiments for this in the pre-war period, all to create a politically acceptable form of jazz music. None of them got very far, of course. Turns out it's hard to create exciting dance music that doesn't swing too hard, right? Yeah, but the, but the need for Nazi-approved jazz 
only heightened when war broke out in 1939. Goebbels knew that foreign broadcasts will now certainly play anti-Nazi propaganda alongside jazz. He banned people from listening to them, but not everyone has obeyed. In 1943, the BBC estimated that between one and three million Germans listened to their special Reichsprogramming. But Goebbels' chief concern is actually for the men of the Wehrmacht. They are always close to a radio, and many of them are big jazz fans, particularly officers and pilots. Their morale is pretty important, and one way to secure it is through a program of Truppenbetreuung, troop entertainment. Goebbels created a special office for this in early 1940, putting SS officer Hans Hinkel in charge. Truppenbetreuung can involve anything from the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra to circus artists, but jazz is in high demand. Goebbels and Henkel quickly realized they cannot do much about this. For one, they don't know where to draw the line between jazz and acceptably German music, and they don't have any jurisdiction over the Wehrmacht anyway. So, some of the hottest jazz can be heard wherever the Wehrmacht is stationed. Hmm. Drummer Freddy Broxieper will remember one concert on the Channel Coast in the winter of uh, 1940. Hmm. After about an hour of German numbers, the soldiers start calling for some solid jazz. Yeah. Hinkle gets on the microphone and tells them that English and Jewish numbers are strictly of limit. What happens? The crowd starts pelting him with apples and oranges until he was forced to retreat, telling the band on his way out that they can play whatever they want. They then uh, start playing lively version of Bei mir bist du schön, a, a tune g- that is both hot and of Yiddish origin. I, I, I love that song, you know. Yeah. Bei mir bist du schön. I don't know all the words. So. I don't know. But they either. want the men want jazz. The men want jazz. Yes, looks that way. And they want it on the radio. In 41, men on active duty were surveyed about what they wanted on Soldatenzender, armed forces radio stations. The result reveal a considerable demand for hot and swinging jazz, apparently. Men in Lapland say the crazier, the better. In Lapland, huh? In Lapland. Well, luckily for them... The Soldaten Zenda already have them covered. See, there are stations all over occupied Europe, and they are outside the jurisdiction of the Reichskulturkammer as well. Many seek out native-made jazz or records otherwise banned inside the Reich. Apparently, Zender Minsk and Zender Belgrad are specialized in spinning high-quality jazz. Yes. Yeah. Goebbels' war against jazz on the home front, though, has never stopped. When America joined the war in December 41, he laid out the following directive. Popular writings should be distributed which are aimed at the broad masses in Germany, but above all the youth, which illustrate that the uncritical acceptance of certain American measures, for example jazz music, etc., demonstrates a lack of culture. Here, amongst others, attention should be drawn to the grotesque misrepresentations which are found, for example, in the transforming of Bach's music into jazz music. But he still wants good light entertainment for civilians and shoulders alike. Mm-hmm. So, even as he directed anti-jazz propaganda, he also looked into easing restrictions on German broadcasting. It can't be called jazz, but some very moderate swinging began to be allowed on the airways around this time. Right. The biggest project here is the Deutsche Tanz- und Unterhaltungsorchester, the DTU, known in English as the German Dance and Entertainment Orchestra. It is formed out of the best musicians Germany has to offer, and some are even withdrawn from service in the Wehrmacht. It is the official state dance band, equal in status to the Berlin Philharmonic. Wow. And it fulfills the dream of creating neue deutsche Tanzmusik. The DTU at its first rehearsal in April 1942. They do not cut any commercial records, and they give few public performances, but they've been broadcasting regularly on both civilian and military airwaves. The music is more swinging than what has been allowed before. But the musicians still have to abide by a number of directives. Complicated rhythms can't be emphasized, and strings often have to carry these simple and sweet melody lines. The player's technical ability is tight, but they are rarely allowed to solo. 
it's unlikely that true jazz fans like them very much. And the SD regularly reports that conservative Germans are displeased by the continued broadcasting of degenerate music. But their broadcasts do seem to be well received by both civilian and military listeners. By all accounts, 1942 and 3 were successful years for the DTU. But by now, in 44, things have started to fall apart. Their Berlin practice hall was bombed last year, so they have had to move to Prague. Some musicians have started to feel rebellious, while the propaganda ministry has started to feel cynical in the face of increasing defeat. Across this year, musicians will be dismissed or drafted into the war. The music will continue but increasingly decline in quality and, of course, originality. It's a rather pathetic ending for the quest for a Nazi German jazz band. But what? they were, all of them, deceived, for another jazz band was made. A swinging band, a secret band, Charlie and his orchestra. This is part of the much bigger and more infamous propaganda effort fronted by William Joyce, a.k.a. Lord Haha. English voices have been broadcasting out of Berlin since before the war began, but Joyce is considered by his Nazi paymasters to be the most effective. He has become the main star of the regular show, Germany Calling. It's targeted mainly at Britain, but there is also the hope that Americans will pick it up as well. In January 40, someone had the idea of complimenting Joy's broadcast with comedy skits and jazz music so that new listeners might be baited into listening. And that is how Charlie and his orchestra was born. Although it's more or less a pre-existing band led by violinist and saxophonist Lutz Templin. Goebbels just provided him with a radio contract and a singer, Carl Charlie Schwedler. Charlie is a bit of a mysterious figure. According to some accounts, he is employed by the foreign ministry. But others say he's part of the propaganda ministry. Anyway, he seems to sing pretty well. And without much of it, well, he's got some accent, but not that much of an accent, right? If you go and listen to him. Templin has also hired Freddie Boxeeper, the drummer from the Trippin' Betroying Circuit. The core band has about 16 members, but it's possible to bring in more if needs be, usually from Gerbil's other musical projects, like the DTU. Top arrangers provide the orchestra with sheet music they've either transcribed from foreign radio, procured from neutral countries, or just had left over from the pre-war days. Yeah, the idea is that the quality of the playing will reel people in and confuse them about the origins of the broadcast. They will then be sitting right by the, uh, by the radio when the propaganda starts coming through. And that propaganda is in the music itself. Sometimes Charlie will sing the song as normal. But most of the time, he will switch to pretty obvious political commentary after a verse or two. Like this 1941 version of the classic music hall song, Daisy. The first verse is normal, but then Charlie goes, here's Churchill's latest appeal to Roosevelt before breaking into the second verse, right? Frankie, Frankie, the Germans are driving me nuts. From Narvik down to Egypt, they took all my landing spots. They've done such a lot of bombing, the docks are completely done in. Now I'm afraid it will be too late. For heaven's sake, hurry up. In theory, <laughs> in theory, this song works on both British and American listeners. In theory, it reminds the Brits about their sorry state of affairs in mid-1941 and suggests to Americans that Churchill is trying to drag Roosevelt into the war. This one is pretty humorous, but other songs have darker undertones. In 1942, the orchestra, they did their own version of By Mia Bistuchen, right? Yeah, yeah. But called it The Anthem of the International Brotherhood of Bolsheviks. Which is a catchy name, right? <laughs> you can probably guess some of the lyrical themes. As with most Nazi propaganda, the Aryans living in Britain and America are rarely attacked in these songs. Goebbels wants them demoralized, but not insulted. They are to be reminded of their dire situation and told that the people to blame are the politicians, bankers, Bolsheviks, and Jews, of course. Charlie and his orchestra are the only instance of jazz propaganda in July 42. A BBC memo reported on a story from a consul general in Zurich. Apparently, 
to shabby-looking Germans on a ferry let slip that they were musicians who were employed to transcribe music heard on foreign broadcast. Apparently, this music was the then recorded by German bands and then broadcast alongside English news that was mostly real but slightly modified to give a pro-German perspective. Okay, that story probably isn't about Charlie and his orchestra because... Everyone associated with it is well paid. Right, yeah. So these shabby Germans, well, they obviously weren't. But it's also a different propaganda methodology from the more obvious political statements heard on Germany calling. Yeah, there's more as well. Lord Haw Haw, female equivalent Mildred Gillers, a.k.a. Axis Sully, yeah. focuses on demoralizing Americans both at home and on the front. She's often accompanied by a live jazz band or recorded music. Another propaganda project, Station Debunk, was targeted towards American Midwesterners. Debunk pretended to be broadcasting from inside America itself and tried to reignite isolationist feeling in the region. Presenters cursed the the drugstore cowboys on the East Coast and mourned the Midwestern farm boys being sacrificed on the altar of mammon. Yes, but does this kind of stuff actually work? Does it? Well, debunk probably doesn't. It suffers from quite a few blunders. The jazz being played is quite outdated, as are the cultural references and the slang. Midwestern Americans aren't huge consumers of jazz. Ironically, they're more likely to listen to polkas and bohemian music at the time, leaving jazz for those drugstore cowboys. The Nazis obviously picked up on this after a while because in late 1942, they gave up playing jazz on debunk. The station also switched to targeting Southerners. Germany Calling, as a whole program, does make some impact in Britain. People tune in to hear the names of allied POWs being read out or to laugh at the ridiculous presentation style. Some people just want to hear news from another perspective. But there is little evidence that Lord Ha Ha changes many opinions and Charlie's orchestra doesn't seem to make an impact on people at all. The newspapers never, ever report on them. Never. Never at all. Mass observation diaries reference Lord Ha Ha 418 times but has literally nothing on his accompanying band. Charlie's music is not as swinging as the music coming out of America anyway, which, incidentally, still finds its way into the Reich. The Allies are just better at propaganda than Germany, particularly Britain. Goebbels has tried, with some success, to block BBC programming, but a whole bunch still slips through. And it's pretty easy to tune into BBC home broadcasts if you live near enough to the coast. The British have even set up Soldatensender Calais, the strongest station on the entire continent and a masterpiece of psychological warfare. Not many people even realize it's broadcasting from the British Isles and assume it's hidden somewhere in France or perhaps really is a German station after all. I am sure Astrid will tell you more about this When the time comes. When the time comes, yes. But for now, let's wrap up the story of Charlie and his orchestra. Like the DTU, it will have a pretty pathetic end. By now, only four Germans are left in the band. Everyone else has been drafted and replaced with foreign musicians. The band is now also in Stuttgart because Berlin is too unsafe. They now just record instrumentals, sending them up to the capital, where Lord Ho Ho and Charlie are still residing. Propaganda officials are also starting to realize that the scheme hasn't worked, but they have also given up trying to do anything about it. No one knows what to do with the boxes of records made by the band, so... A whole bunch are just shipped out to the Wehrmacht on the front line. Great idea. On the front line, yeah. On the front line, yes. Eventually, even Stuttgart will stop being safe. The local radio station will be destroyed by firebombing. The Nazi Jazz Project. Up Up in flames. Up in flames, yes. Yes, quite literally. You know, a comedian will one day say... 
that if you're going to do an impression of someone, you have to like the person because you're playing the person and people like themselves. And maybe that applies here. Nazi propaganda to Britain and America is overall a failure. And Charlie and his orchestra are an even bigger failure. Could the Nazis' disdain for these cultures be so great that maybe they can't convincingly mimic them? They hate them too much to understand them. Maybe. And that would be kind of ironic because Goebbels once said that what makes Nazi propaganda so effective was its ability to see into the soul of the people and to speak the language of the man in the street. Wow. It's even more ironic because the story of jazz in the Third Reich shows that the Nazis can be flexible in some of their ideological principles. Goebbels recognized the huge demand for light entertainment and jazz and sought out ways to integrate it into the German culture. But he wasn't flexible enough and his project just died out. Hmm. Hey, Astrid. Yes, indeed. You know what? What? You're the top. You're a German flyer. You're the top. You're machine gun fire. You're a U-boat chap with a lot of pep. You're grand. You're a German blitz. The Paris Ritz. An army van. 